Welcome back to Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, presented by Bolin Media. I am Ross Bolin, here with Barrett Dudley to begin our coverage of Silo, Season 1, from Apple TV+. And Barrett, whatever you do during recording today, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do not say you want to go outside or I will press the eject button and you will be shot through that window into the backyard. (laughs) And then what, are you going to make me clean something out there? I'm going to ask you to. You're going to ask me to clean. I cannot you force you to you clean. You cannot force me to clean anything out there no. if I don't want to clean it. That's true. Once you're outside the window, you will be outside the rules and regulations of the podcast studio. I will no longer be constrained by the law. That's right. That's fortunately, right. Fortunately for you, I will not make that request today as uh, we're officially hitting the triple digits this week. Right. And I do not want to go outside. I would like to stay in the silo where it is safe. Absolutely. And cool. I w- I, it made me and dark and nice and air conditioned and air conditioned it made me think how many people in this uh, hot Texas heat might yeah. enjoy a silo. Yeah, I mean, as long as the people in the down deep, you know, as long as they continue keeping the lights on and keeping this place alive, then uh, then we should have we should have no trouble. No yeah, trouble. You, you got to take a giant wrench. Yeah. To the old generator down there. Sometimes you do. Sometimes keep the people do. alive. Yeah, that's what yeah. you got to do. And if you don't, if you don't, I will promptly report your ass to judicial. Hell yeah. <laughs> Because you want to stay alive and cool. That's right. That's right. Today we are covering episodes one and two of Silo on Apple TV+, Plus. so make sure you have watched the first two episodes before we spoil the living shit out of them for you. <laughs> we start this series with a close-up shot of Jocelyn's face as she is directed by a photographer to... Oh, I'm sorry, wait. <laughs> my bad. Those are my notes for The Idol, which we yeah. are no longer covering. That's right. You're, d- you're doing uh, that podcast under a pseudonym. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you, any of you, you what it is, you though. You can't tell, yeah. But, uh, but, it's a yeah. secret. It's a secret. We start Silo on Apple TV Plus with a shot of Holston Becker, played by David Oyelowo. Oyelowo. Yeah, that's right. Who is probably best known for playing Dr. Martin Luther King in Selma. I believe that is the thing I know him best from anyway. Um, Holston is seen getting dressed for the day. He's tidying up his place. And then he unscrews the screws on a circular vent of some kind within his residence, Barrett. And I make note of this because the shot of him unscrewing the screws on this vent really fades from your mind as you watch the first episode or really first two episodes unfold. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to imagine that that plays a factor at some point later on. Right. Yeah, the little vent. Like maybe it's a way back in. Right, something. It seemed too small for a human to fit it. I don't know what he was doing with the fucking vent is my point. Yeah, no yeah. nor do I. And but now maybe you can remind me since you're the one over there with the the, I've dil- got the notes. To diligently taken notes. When is this? Uh this is He's the about day... to say that he would like to go outside, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Okay. So he knows so that things day. at that point. He's yeah. preparing his space. And about to bounce, yeah. Oh, yeah, low, whoa. Oh, yeah, low, whoa. Oh, yeah, low, whoa. Yeah, that's Thank what we you. said, right? Oh, yeah, low, whoa. Yeah. I think I was close, but I'll get it over the course of the season. Yeah. Um, so he walks us out into the silo, which so we see it for the first time, right? And it's this, uh, that's our setting for, I have to imagine, the strong majority of the show, if not just season one. The uh, the silo? Yeah. Oh, sure, hon. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's named after all. <laughs> Um, and we hear as he as he walks out, we hear our first rendition of the pledge of the people living in the silo, which is that we do not know why we are here. We do not know who built the silo. We do not know why everything who built the silo? <laughs> why everything outside the silo is as it is. Not very specific. We do not know when it will be safe to go outside. We only know that day is not this day. And the setup for this show and just the general, the setting on the whole in the silo uh, reminds me a lot of the video game Fallout. Did you ever play Fallout? I did not, no. 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 Well, you start out in like an underground bunker in a post-apocalyptic situation. And, okay. And uh, kind of reminded me of that. Anyway, Holston goes on to tell his deputy, Deputy Marnes, played by Will Patton, who I will always know as the racist white team's coach in Remember the Titans. He, yeah, yeah. This yes. guy gets around, though. He's oh, had he's a hell of a career. Of stuff. Yep. Uh, he tells him to meet him in, in Holding 3, which we all know what happens from there. Pretty much gives us our setup for this whole season, right? If, if, <clears throat> if not just this first episode. Holston locks himself in the cell. He looks out the window, talking about how he should have done this years ago, but he wouldn't listen. And he says uh, the thing you 100% do not want to say in the silo, but Barrett says it every Friday night. <laughs> I want to go out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
so then from there we like we flash back um, to why he has locked himself in this cell and said he wants to go out. He he's like meeting in the past, you know, before this this setup scene we've opened the show with. He's meeting with his wife, Allison, played by Rashida Jones, and they found out they've been given clearance to uh, attempt to reproduce a baby. Right, so they have one year starting right now to become pregnant, and there's a countdown on this computer. Yeah. Um, but as we know, Barrett, they aren't actually given the opportunity to get pregnant as judicial and the powers that be do not deem Allison the kind of person they wish to get pregnant. That's right. She asks too many questions. Uh, they go to the doctor, and the doctor basically pretends to take out her birth control, which is this weird cylindrical metal mm-hmm, piece, mm-hmm. but they don't really take it out. She does it herself at the end of the episode, obviously. Um, to get through some basic details here, she works in IT, Allison does, for the silo, right? And she makes a post about recovering deleted files, which her boss, played by Tim Robbins from The Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> removes and reprimands her for doing it. It's just a ridiculous cast on this show. It's Did you ever see that terrifying out. movie where Tim Robbins like lives in a neighborhood but is like a building bomber? Do you remember that no. one? Is it is it about the Unabomber? I think it's like m- loosely inspired by maybe building bombing. I'm googling Tim Robbins Arlington Road. Arlington Road. That's the one. No, I never saw this one. That's a good thriller. If you've never seen Arlington Road and you want to see Tim Robbins at his at his at his creepiest, huh? The Unabomber yeah. died recently. That's right. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ted, whatever. Ted Kaczynski. Kaczynski. Yeah, yeah whatever. Um. Yes. Yet, uh, and just a quick note, I mm-hmm. would say I, I don't spend a ton of time, or I have not, or we have not in the past, on Apple TV Plus. There's not some, a ton. No. There's some stuff that I've watched here and there. I've I've yet to uh, to catch up on season three of Ted Lasso, but I watched the first two. I also really like the show Physical, um, but I still haven't watched season two, and season three is on its way on Apple TV Plus. But by and large, I've not spent a ton of time on on Apple TV Plus. And just getting into their little hype mix trailers and looking around on that, it's very clear that what Apple like that the Apple TV Plus proposition is basically we're going to throw a bunch of B minus to B plus shows at you, and they are good. None of them are really great, but they all have absolutely loaded casts. Yeah, they got the money to spend. Loaded, on that. loaded, loaded casts. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're yeah. not wrong. Um, Ted Lasso is definitely the one I'm most familiar with. I also have not watched season three yet because, uh, frankly, it's just slipping down my list of I know, priorities I know. the more it yeah. gets hated on. Yeah. Um, but I love the first two seasons, and uh, yeah, for the for the most part, Apple TV Plus is not a place that I am browsing yeah. looking for new shows. They've got a lot of stuff that looks really interesting. They do, um, but yeah, their their brand right now definitely like reads is like, "Hey, we have the star power here." Yes, absolutely, and that's the way they're marketing it too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she she works for the IT department. She gets in trouble for this deleted files post. They don't want people recovering deleted files, Barry. Absolutely not. There are rules. Too many rules. We find out these people have been told, the people in the silo, that they lost their history because. The rebels deleted everything, burned everything, erased all history of what happened in this place and prior, right? What, yeah, and rebellion was 140 years ago? Yes. Which I think is, is it's a, that's a pretty interesting piece of the concept that this all, like, I, I was thinking of it in terms of, like, the American Revolution, right? So you're basically, like, dealing with, like, this would be kind of 1920-ish, right? Something like, yeah, you yeah. Know? Kind of yeah. like in in the in terms of American history, but like where there was like a big, there was a big rebellion, and now obviously things sh- shake out differently here. The rebellion is squashed, right? But like the just the time, allegedly the timeline is interesting to think about. Yeah, like they're you know they're talking about things that are a hundred like relics, right? Which you're not supposed to have all 150 years old, right? Like ancient to, to in in our minds, right? Yeah, it's like a generation and a half. Oh, like it's weird time. The older I get, the more I'm like, 100 years ago is not that long. No, no. Right? Like my grandma is 92. Right. And she's she's almost been around 100 years, yeah. which just it puts things in a strange perspective, but um yeah, 140 years, you're not allowed to have relics from the before times as they call them. But again, to put it in like modern day things, like relics would be from like the 1800s at this point. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's well, and it's just, it's odd because, like, obviously, this 140-year period, it's not like they were pre-technology. Right, right, yes. In that 
in the early to, or in the uh, in the before times. Yes, yeah, right? they had watches and shit and like if anything, computer drives. They're, they're you know like a lot of post apocalyptic stuff. They've they've taken steps down in technology. Yeah, I think what is is what is most likely. They don't know what a one of the relics that we're, we'll later see is like a video camera. Nobody knows what the shit that is. Yeah, notable also that on Allison's desk, photo of her husband uh, Holston is like a painting. Right, right. Not a no, not a so, photograph. So not even cameras right now. Yeah, it's very. Um, and all their computers are like 1978 Macs. Yeah, no, that's one of the weird <laughs> things is that when you see the computers, when you see them going to the computer screen to get their whether or not they've been approved to reproduce, uh, it's all super super old school in yeah. terms of its uh, production value, right? Um, and the show seems to be harping pretty early on on the importance of history, right? Recording history having history yeah. for people to reflect on, know about, learn about, mm -hmm. um, which is certainly, you know, I, I'm not I'm not saying specifically right now it's an extremely relevant topic. It's just a relevant topic, I think, throughout the course of humanity. Yeah. Uh, but no relics. If you get caught with a relic, you're uh, violating the pact, which stipulates that you shan't have relics and you end up being sent to the mines. Yeah. I don't think we see the mines in we the first two episodes. Uh, but yeah. Um, there's also a door to the outside world that our Sheriff Holston Becker is meant to protect and keep from being opened. And we find out early on, it's referenced, like, if you violate the rules, one of the potential punishments is you can be sent outside to clean. Which just sounds funny when it they're does, saying it, it at does. first. You're like, Every, and, and both times that they have uh, strapped somebody up in the suit yeah. and, and given the whole spiel, I chuckle at the part where it's like... <laughs> We ask you to clean, but we cannot force you to clean. You may go outside and you may clean, or you do not have to clean. We cannot make you clean, but you cannot come back here, <laughs> regardless. It just like for some reason, it just like feels like an SNL sketch. A it's little a little bit, silly. The, the cleaning, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, you can you can go clean or you can not clean. Yeah. Um, Allison meets with this hippy dippy older lady named Gloria, who suggests that they have been lied to about what happened, why they live here, what's out there. And whether or not Allison is actually able to get pregnant. Um, Allison and Holston keep banging, though, and, and trying to no avail, which drives Allison's suspicions that this woman, Gloria, might be telling her the truth. Yeah, or Gloria is like planting the seed of like, things are not as they seem. Yeah, yeah, yeah like she might be part of some secret society or some shit. I don't know. Um, but in the lead up to what they call Founders Day and the Founders Day celebration that evening, Allison goes to provide IT support to a dude working in computer repair. His name is George. And this dude had an old drive brought to him about a year ago that appeared to be erased but had most of its space occupied by existing files that he could not access. Uh, the drive is over 140 years old uh, from the before times. And Allison helps the dude get into the drive which has all kinds of crazy shit into it, like like silo blueprints. So clearly this thing um, has the history that they're looking for, right? That yeah. they thought yes. was erased. a lot of info. And at first, Allison is like, hell no, I'm not looking at this. They could send us out to clean for this, which again, it sounds fun. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's not that bad of a punishment. Uh, these people fucking hate cleaning, though, you know? So a lot of time passes in this episode, literally a full year of attempting to conceive between Allison and Holston uh, takes place, and over time, she grows more and more suspicious that she isn't actually being allowed to get pregnant. Eventually, she goes back to the kooky lady, Gloria, again, who tells her um, some shit with the sink running. she That's all you gotta do. Just turn on that's, the sink. That is right, yeah. I love how in some shows and movies, they put on, like, music as loud as it can be played, mm -hmm. and that's how they get yeah, rid of yeah. the, you know... Um, Tony Soprano and the Sopranos goes down into the basement where his air conditioning makes more noise and he mm -hmm. thinks that'll do the job. This lady just turns on the sink. Oh, I got, yeah. yeah. Just a little bit of water is all it water takes. running. Uh -huh. totally, well, don't forget, their technology is, is, is you know, it's not as up to speed as, as ours is. It's not as advanced. It's limited. It's limited, so, you know. Gotta do what you gotta do, though. Yeah. Um, so, whatever Gloria tells her here, we, are, we don't get to be privy to. We're not... We don't get to watch that conversation, but it does inspire Allison to go back and see George, the computer repairman, again. And she tells George she wants to see everything in this old drive. And she ends up going through, I guess, like as much as they can get through this first day. Um, and then they're like, all right, well, she's like, well, let's do one more. And they click one more file. And it's this uh, file called Jane Carmody Cleaning. 
which seems like it's a it's a recording of someone who went out to clean, right? Named Jane Carmody, you have to assume. And it's the last thing that Allison watches before snapping, basically. And we don't really get to see it. Yeah. We just see the reflection of like some birds flying overhead. And it it ends up matching up almost exactly with what Holston sees when he goes outside in mm-hmm. the beginning of episode two. But um it just makes me wonder. We we don't get to know how much information she gets here. Obviously, the remainder of the show, or at least season one, will be us getting bits and pieces of what exactly drove Allison to do what she did, and then Holston after her, and and figure this whole thing out. Right? Very yeah. puzzle boxy, like you said it would yeah. be going yeah. in. Um. So the full year of pregnancy opportunity time expires, and Allison does not show up for her and Holston's final meeting with the doctor. So the good sheriff Holston goes to find her and discovers her in their quarters where she tells him that they did not take out her birth control. The protectors of the pact only want obedient, docile people reproducing and that she has cut out the birth control device that the doctor said he removed. So she's bleeding pretty badly. It's kind of a shocking moment here where, you you know, they they show the knife and you're like, oh, my God, she Mm. just like got in there herself. She needed that. She needed that proof. Yeah. Um. So Holston, like, he sprints off to get help. He's like, shit, she's going to bleed to death. Um, I got to save my wife. And uh, But when she gets back, or he's on his way back, we find out she's in the cafeteria. And she's telling everyone that this place is a lie, that they're keeping them inside with lies, that it is green out there, there's green trees and blue skies and things flying in the air, and that the display they see is a lie. So up to this point, I was like, oh, look, they've got windows all over the silo where you can... See out right. into the world. Yeah, yeah. And then I was thinking about it as this scene is unfolding, like, well, if the silo is a shit ton of stories, because they've shown it, you know, it goes way, way up or way, way down, and they, you wouldn't have the same view from all these different floors. Yeah, like, you no. keep seeing it in different... Anyways, Safe to so, assume that the silo, I think, goes down. Down into yeah. the ground, yeah. yeah. And they... Uh, so this thing, the cafeteria, for example, that is a giant screen. right. You know, like a computer screen. Yeah. When he's in the holding cell and Holston is looking out, that is also a screen, um, which I just didn't really realize up front. Yeah. So at first, Holston thinks Allison is having like a breakdown because she's bleeding. She hasn't been able to get pregnant. They've tried three different times. That's three different years of nonstop attempt. Mm. And uh, you would be exhausted and mentally broken by that. So um, he's just, he's trying to calm her down and she apologizes, but... uh, she says what Barrett says every Friday night, I want to go out. <laughs> uh, and if you boil the pack down to one rule, Barrett, it's you do not say you want to go outside or you will fucking go outside. Yeah. So in her cell before her exit, Allison tells Holston why she has done what she's done to some extent, um, that she believes she will not actually die out there and that they have the ability to change what the people in the silo see on these screens so that what they see is not what is actually outside. Yeah. Um, Hater, she, haters will say it's photoshopped. Exactly. So Holston tell, uh, she tells Holston she does not know why they don't want them to go outside because that's his question. He's like, well, okay, well, let's say you're right. It's fucking beautiful out there. Everything is hunky-dory. Why are they keeping us in this goddamn silo? And she says she doesn't know, but she's going to go find out. Um, she also asks him, why do people clean? And she suspects that people clean because they hope that somehow they can show people the truth that the image they're seeing out there is a lie. Right. So like, oh, I gotta clean. I gotta clean this lens. Which still, it's not. It's doing. It's if I clean it, it'll show the brightness and the light. Like, I mean, but no, because this is one of the things <laughs> about the show that I was like, okay, frankly. If I climb up those stairs, uh-huh. the thing opens up, and I'm out there in my space suit, and I see <laughs> it's all green and yeah. glorious. The way I indicate to people that, hey, they're lying to you, is not going to be to go fucking clean the little sensor yeah. camera You're shit. You're going to like do some pointing I'm going to be like, screaming. woo! Yeah. Woo! And like run yeah. off into the glory, right? But like, like a, and do like some Pictionary stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're pointing at this guy. You're making flapping. <laughs> flapping like a bird, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we can get to this a little bit later in, in episode two. Uh, so anyway, she tells Holston that if she gets outside and the image they see on the screens is real, she won't clean. She will simply wave goodbye because she'll have made the biggest mistake of her life. Yeah. But if she gets out there and it's green and lush and beautiful, she'll start to clean and he'll know. <laughs> So Allison gets sent out to clean. Uh, she ascends the steps into the outside world. She looks around, and then as her husband looks on, she approaches the window, and 
she clings to raucous applause from with a, the uh, with a with a gleam in her eye. I yeah, would say, yeah. You know? She like she looks a, like a bit of a smirk. Like I was right. Yeah, I was right. Yeah. You know, she even hits him with like a little a little, a little smirk. Smile. Like you yeah, said. a yeah. little placid little smile, smirk, like no a knowing glance. Yeah, which is when I started to get into like, well, let me finish. So then, <laughs> as she turns to walk over the hill, she stumbles, falls, regains her footing, then falls again mm. and appears to die. Yeah. Um. At least that's what we see the people watching on the screen bear it. Yeah. So we're not given any view from like her perspective. It's just us watching the people in the cafeteria watch on the screen. Right. So obviously, based on her theory that they can manipulate the screen to show whatever they want, we're very uh, suspicious of what we're shown, right? Um, it's just, it's and, unusual because it... It makes me wonder how far, like, okay, so th- did they manipulate, could they manipulate it to make it look like somebody cleaned when they didn't? Is that why everybody cleans? Because we don't actually ever get to see what is happening out there? <laughs> it's just a lot of questions, you know, we're going to have yeah. a lot of questions. Um, so we flash forward two years to Holston finding out that George the computer guy went over the rail somewhere around level 120 and he's dead. And there's this engineer named Juliet Nichols who believes he was murdered. So Holston goes to meet with Juliet, played by Rebecca Ferguson, otherwise known as Timothée Chalamet's Bene Gesserit mom in Dune, is what I know her as. Yeah, also a uh, key role in the most recent Mission Impossible movies. Ah. I think coming back for this one that's about to release in the summer. How about that? Yeah. She's having a hell of a career currently. Love Rebecca Ferguson. Yeah. I'm a big fan. She's great. Um, so episode one ends with Deputy Marnes asking Holston what exactly changed for him when he met Juliet and Holston explaining that he's going to out he's gonna find Allison and the truth. And that's why he's asked to to go outside or said he wants to go outside. Because he's gotta know the truth, Barrett. The truth will set him free. Um it is interesting to me that there is a character or an actress from Dune. Rebecca Ferguson, because the music in this show is very similar to the music in Dune. It was just something I noticed that was, uh, I'm not saying they're related in any way. I'm just saying. Well, uh, that that's a nice segue into one something that we can talk about here in between, yeah. between episodes. What is the show reminding you of? Because for, for us, Laura and I were getting a lot of Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. A little bit of Hunger Games for sure. And I was, it made me wonder, I have not looked this up. I, I could have easily, but I, you know, wanted to save it for, for chat on the pod. But like, so Silo is based on a series of three books, I believe, a, right. a trilogy. And I thought that Silo was maybe like more in the mold of like some kind of more cerebral, higher, I guess what I would call like higher end sci-fi. But in the show, it's reading very much like YA to me. Like 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 young adult, oh sure yeah yeah no- novelization some of the because it's reminding me of stuff like Hunger Games or even like books that you read in middle school like The Giver or you know some of those ones where there's like you know some kind of unknown cast system and there's people pulling the strings from behind the scenes that are like in the know right and then all the commoners and and the people in the deep down and really everybody is is like kind of like in the dark about what is actually happening. And so, and it, and it gets into all those kind of like, I, I think the way, the reason it feels like that is because those books are often kind of posing questions in a very, in like a way that's easy to digest for broad swaths of people, like, you know, about humanity and right and wrong and government and, and all those types of things. So I'm just like, I, I, so now I'm, I'm wondering like how the books actually read. Like, are they more, are they like kind of, are they deeper or are they more like on that young adult wave? Yeah. I mean, if you're going off the show, I have to agree with you. It does, because it's, it's a, it's not that complicated of a setup, right? And it's kind of involving a bunch of different um, aspects of other things we've seen before, Mm -hmm. you know? The biggest difference being, of course, that it takes place in a silo underground, which is why they named it Silo. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of sci-fi references and, and things to pick up on here. I think, um, you know, that's that's sci-fi these days, right? Like you can't. It's super hard to to feel novel or fresh uh, because it's so much of it has been done at this point. But uh, the silo itself and looking down uh, into the into the depths reminds me of Zion in the in the Matrix yeah. sequels. Definitely. Okay, so that's another one I got big vibes from. Matrix vibes, uh-huh. especially when we start to meet some people from judi- judicial 
like common. Yeah, with, yeah, with common with his leather blazer. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's looking a little neo. He is. A, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I also got Hunger Games vibes, like you said. So where where were you? Episode one ends credits roll. Uh huh. Where were you at? Headspace I mean, wise here. I, I was I was pretty good. Like I despite the fact that uh you know in in the light of day today and in the middle of the week, um the cleaning thing is is ringing even funnier to me than it did uh while watching. Yeah. But I I this is definitely this show is was immediately after the first episode scratching an itch that I maybe like didn't even know like I had. Which is kind of a, which is that kind of puzzle box mystery. Ooh, what's going on? Some things are going to be obscured. Now we're going to be like looking for clues and kind of like slowly peeling back the onion to 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 see what's what's actually going on. And that's always fun. Um, I think I I was talking with some 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 folks in the Discord about like you know, and I was just like now. This this is based on a completed set of books, right? Like there is because that that <laughs> is definitive ending, right? That is what is always uh, now in the back of my mind uh, is is like how things can fly off the rails if if there's not a completed story to kind of base everything off of. So because I just you know I don't want a lost situation, nor do I want a final season of Game of Thrones. Situation. Well, that's always the fear. So. With these types of shows, yeah, right? It's yeah. what's happening with Yellow Jackets right now, yeah. where season two just ended, and I'm like, damn near close to hitting the ejector switch myself because yeah. I'm just like, they're not, they're just, it's dragging out, yeah, without really giving you anything. Yes, it's just, te- you know how this first episode is a massive dick tease because it's just right. like, right, yeah, you're like, whoa, it's just the setup, yeah. She found something out. Why don't we get to know what she found out? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and that continues in episode two as well, but it's just tea. It's, it's a tease in a good way. This first episode where it ended and I was like, okay, I'm in for this. Yeah. I like, lo- yes, same. I felt the same. Um, and it was well done enough and the story was kind of compact enough and, and didn't go too, too off the rails at all to, to keep me strapped in and focused the entire episode, which is really what I'm looking for on, on a TV show. Right. And I think after episode one, it landed firmly in what you described as sort of Apple TV Plus's um, wheelhouse right now, where I was like, this is a B, B plus, right, pilot episode for, yeah. for television. I wasn't like, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever seen. But I was entertained. I had a lot of questions. I was excited to see more and uh, just kind of went from there, you know? Mm-hmm. You know what I bet everybody in the silo wishes they had, Barrett? What's that? Today's sponsor, Factor. Now that it's summer, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for active, sunny days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with a flavorful and nutritious ready-to-eat meal delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track reaching your goals. If you're too busy to cook this summer with Factor, skip the trip to the grocery store and skip the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up to Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat them in the microwave and enjoy them, then get back outside and soak up the warmer weather. Or let's be real, sometimes you need something healthy to eat while you enjoy your favorite shows from the couch. If you want to cut back on takeout this summer, get Factor instead. Not only is Factor cheaper than takeout, but meals are ready faster than restaurant delivery in just two minutes. No more waiting an hour and a half for the delivery guy who ends up canceling after deciding to eat your food in their car. Factor has been fueling my wife and I over the last couple of months with a newborn at home since I don't know how to cook and my wife doesn't have time. And I've tried a lot of meal kits over the years. Factor is by far the most delicious, truly shockingly good. I love the smoothies as well. They are delicious. I usually have one for breakfast when I'm running out the door to work. So if you're living life on the fly like I am, I could not more highly recommend Factor. If you're living life in the silo with limited options for food, it's time to sign up for Factor with our special offer just for members of the Silo Squad. Head to factormeals.com slash OCC50 and use code OCC50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code OCC50 at factormeals.com slash OCC50 to get 50% off your first box. So let's jump in episode two. You ready? I'm ready. So we start off the second episode with Holston being suited up to exit the silo and uh, potentially clean. Um, he's being read his last rites or whatever that, again, kind of make you chuckle in hindsight. To clean or not to clean? <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> it is the question. It is the question. Um, and I think you you put it perfectly where it's like, when you're watching it, it's not that silly. Yeah. Like, you're not like, oh, okay. But 
after the fact when you're thinking <laughs> back to it and like the concept of cleaning being uh, this huge story yes. thing yeah. uh, is a little funny. So the lucky lottery winners gather in the cafeteria to watch him go out because only a certain amount of people get to watch from the cafeteria on the really big screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everybody else is like yeah. scattered throughout the silo or whatever. Now, I think we're seeing multiple cafeterias. Possible. Because, right. Because Sheriff Holston, he's from the up top. Mm -hmm. And then we got, we have uh, Rebecca Ferguson's character, whose name is slipping my mind right now. Uh, you know, she's she's in the deep down. Juliet. Juliet. Yeah. And when when shit goes haywire, when there's nearly a riot, that's in the deep down cafeteria. But I think there's another cafeteria. I think you like might be right. Allison and Holston are like having their meal and Gloria first approaches them and like, you know what I mean? Because we're talking 150 stories at least here. So there's got to be thousands and thousands of people in this place, oh, right? Yeah. Like I'm... That's one thing we don't come out of the first two episodes with. Though. No, we don't know. Population. But like, I would almost bet like a, like a million, maybe. Maybe it's less than that. Don't it's know. It's probably less than that. It's probably 100,000. Yeah, let's but, say let's say 100K. But it seems like a lot of You would need people. more than one cafeteria. Like, this is like a full city, and they mention, that, you know, they make many references to how, like, you know, going down to the computer guy, like, going to see, like, that take that took a day to get down right. there, basically. A full you day know? of travel, because there's right. no fucking elevators. No, there is not. Because that technology didn't survive or I something. Guess, I, I guess not, yeah. Um, I'm sure we'll find out more in terms of what's with the stairs, yeah. really. We're right. having to do stairs. Yeah, stairs. Crazy. Yeah. And, so, and in fact, some people have to toss ropes off the things and then climb down them in very precarious manners. Yeah. And terrifying ladders <laughs> down to the deep as well. Um, but the, the people gather in the cafeteria. We see Holston come out, ascend to the stairs. He looks around. Then we get a shot from his perspective Instead of the screen, yeah, where he says, "Damn it, Allison, you were right," and so the rocky and barren area we see on the screens is actually, from his perspective, outside, green with grass. The trees are green. The sky is blue. Those birds fly by almost exactly like they did in the clip that Allison discovered on the hard drive. Uh, and Holston says they have to see, so he turns around, walks back to the camera, he cleans it. Everybody applauds his cleaning effort. <laughs> they always clean. Do you think it's ever somebody gets out there and they're cleaning, but they miss like a corner? You know? Yeah, I definitely do. Well, when they show it from his perspective on this on this scene, mm -hmm. you, we even get the shot that's like you can see where this is literally yeah, just a camera, little right. Yeah, the camera setup. Little bitty yeah. camera. He sees back behind the camera. Everything out there. It just seems like it's in the middle of like some nature setting, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, then things get kind of confusing because we see him walk off toward the hill and stumble a bit from the screen's perspective. But also from his perspective, he falls to the ground. Yeah. And then from the screen's perspective, we see him rip the helmet off, and somebody even says, like, has anybody ever gotten the helmet off before? <laughs> and we see him struggling to breathe from both the screen perspective and from the first person, like, or third person perspective we're yes. given of him outside. Yes. Um, and then he dies right next to his wife, Allison, by the tree. But, of course, from his outside perspective, we could clearly see... There is no dead body by the tree. Like, he, he turns and looks to that horizon and, like, starts walking up the hill, and there is no, you know, there's, like, three, at that point, I think there were supposed to be three bodies out there. Allison's, which falls by the tree, and then the last two people who had gone to clean had also died, and he had pointed them out on screen to her as well. Like, But now, they don't cut back to him once he gets the helmet off, I don't think. No, they do. They do. But it's only on his face. They yes. They only show his face. Yeah, and you can see him kind of struggling with breathing uh, right and then they go back to the screen and that's when he falls and everybody's yep. like oh bummer he fucking died but he's like right next to her and it's kind of romantic you know yeah so let's let's take a let's take the moment here yeah. and talk about what we think is going on here yeah do you think either of them or, is dead or at least the options yeah right because i think I think the most obvious thing is like, or, or one of the first things that you probably think about is like, okay, well, outside's fine, but they strap you up in this suit, which they're taping up all the seams to. So they're just poison gassing you in the suit and then you stumble and you die. Yes. But he gets the helmet off and still seems to die. Um, now, obviously, Allison's theory is that the screen is all manipulated and that that is not what's actually out and they there. they can show whatever. She sees the video on, on the hard drive um, and then, you know, does her own cleaning smirky thing, nods to Holston to say, yes, it's green and beautiful out here and everything's totally fine. Um, but then we do get the perspective from Holston where it starts to look like maybe actually what's being manipulated is the, vi is the view from inside the helmet. 
right? Potentially. Like that seems to create this filtering or video effect where you do see the birds and the greenery and all that type of stuff. So maybe that's what's fake. Possibly. So those are kind of the two the the two options, right? Or 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 two of the options is that they're either faking what they see when they go out there via the helmet and the suit or the screen is fake. Now, here here was my main question because like we're definitely kind of teed up here with what Allison says, like I'm going to go out there, I'm going to find it, I'm going to come back for you. I'm going to find the truth. It's totally fine. So I'm like I was kind of ready to think that she's not actually dead on that hill and that she does get out. But then why would they do that? Why would they just let people go join essentially a possible new rebellion out there? And that's where your helmet theory comes in for me. I My thing was like, why wouldn't you, if you don't trust these people, you don't trust what you're being shown on these screens, why would you, the first thing you do when you get out there needs to be to take that fucking helmet off? Yeah. Because clearly they could have some device to pump poison into the helmet and murder you, yeah. right? And he does seem to like, once he gets to the point of struggling, realize like, oh shit, this helmet, and, and get it off, Yeah. right? I don't know, I mean, the obvious reason for manipulating the screen for the people inside is to keep them inside, Yes. right? Keep this workforce Right, we haven't met anybody at the up top. We don't know what kind of lavish lifestyle they're living as a result of these people's hard work or whatever. Right, um, but it does have like that big kind of cult vibes, right? Like just kind of like control, right, is a thing that, yep. that often yep. people in power attempt to uh, gain more of. Um, so you can see, like the screen thing makes sense. My read was that he gets out there. Yes, the screen is fake, and that. There's not really any way to communicate that to the people, right? So you just do the cleaning, and then who knows what we what actually occurs? We don't have any fucking clue right now, realistically, mm-hmm. um, because to your point, what we are shown with Holston's quote unquote death scene is it leaves it so open ended. But my read was he does not see a body by that tree, therefore confirming that something is off here. Mm-hmm. So we see him struggling and stuff, and it could be, frankly. He just climbed 140 fucking floors to get out of there, right? You go up stairs. You have to walk out of the silo. So you would be physically exhausted. Then we don't know what planet they're on or whatever. Like, it could be anywhere. Who knows what the pressure is like out there, what kind of toll gravity would take, the the environment versus the environment inside the silo. So Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that us seeing him really struggle to breathe and, and seemingly collapsing means that he's dead. I, I mean, totally. Don't know. I, I, there's, there is, uh, <laughs> I would say 50-50 that Allison and Holston right now are dead versus not dead. Yeah. But the thing, I mean, um, she clearly found information in that drive that was enough for her to either, th- to, to be willing to throw her life away, yeah, right? Yeah. To find out the truth. My, yeah. My thought on that wrinkle is that potentially the video that they, that she watches that we see reflected in her eyeglasses is a video from the perspective of of like basically like like could be like a tutorial or a test video like here's what the cleaners see or are going to see right you know if it came from the kind of the 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 malicious top cast system here yeah so that that's that that's one way that you could frame that up but totally i think it's you know like then you go a deeper level you go outside of the show like well did you cast Rashida Jones and David oh you oh Man, it's just like a tongue twister. Oyo oh, Wolo? Oh yeah. Oyo oh, Oyo oh, Oyo oh, Lowo? Oh, yeah, Lowo. It's a tough one. Oyo oh, Lowo. Do you cast David Oyo oh, Lowo and Rashida Jones and then just like toss them away? Well, yeah, you might. They're not huge stars. They're well known names. You know them from from certain things. They're not just that guys. Like, but like you you know them, but they're also not it's not Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston either. So you could see using them for just like one season. They're going to be in a bunch of flashbacks, obviously, right. as they tie these two, you know, pieces of the the timeline together, um, and go back and then go forward again. And so, like, yeah, maybe they're just season one, and all we're going to see from them is flashbacks, and they're dead on that hill. Or equally as likely, something's going on here, and they make it past the hill, and there's like a new, and eventually we're going to get to the outside people. And what's happening with that? And we may discover them there. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it, it really makes you wonder because a lot of the setup is relatively simplistic, right? Like, it's not that complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and I wonder how much twisty turny type shit. Because I mean, I think I'm geared up to expect like, well, they both survived, right? Now it's up to the people that are inside. Yeah. And Juliet being sort of our main character now right, right. to figure out what is happening and get out and join them, and then they become a rebellion and they come in and set everybody in the silo free, right? Yeah, like yeah. that's the yes. the obvious sort of path of this show. Yeah. Now the obvious path is not always good. Right? If I can sit here and come up with it in thirty seconds, maybe it's not the best story. <laughs> so I don't I don't really know what to expect. Yeah. I don't. Uh, I at this point I expect that it will be more twisty and turny than episode one may have let on. I, yeah, I, I'm expecting many twists and turns. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, after uh, he goes down, Juliet Nichols freaks out and calls Holston a fucking liar very loudly and publicly. Like, we didn't get to see any of the conversations between them, really, until we sort of get some of them later so in this episode. Back. Yep, yep. Um, but she goes down to work in the down deep again, and then uh, we see Deputy Marnes and Mayor Johns concerned about instability and a potential uprising with a lack of a sheriff, right? And people being upset that they sent the sheriff out to clean. So they have to get a new sheriff in as quickly as possible, but they can't really decide who it should be. The deputy wants to retire. He's old. Uh, then a fight breaks out over a hammer because all the people are gearing up with hammers and mm -hmm. pipes. Yeah, down at recycling. Just in case. Yeah. Everybody knows if there's about to be a fight. <laughs> Everybody needs to get to recycling. Yeah. Get some shit to hit people get with. Get your pipe in your hand. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Common from Judicial, who is dressed like he's in the Matrix, comes and breaks it up. His character name is Robert Sims. And uh, it's just our first look at Judicial. That's yeah. the reason that that's, scene yeah, was important. That's the, right? only, only, uh, the only Judicial spotting we've had so far. They're dressed very differently. They stand out like a sore thumb. Everybody, including the local law enforcement, is terrified of them. Um we meet Martha Walker, who is played by Harriet Walter. Oh, you talking about Mama Roy? Yeah. Yes. Otherwise known as Lady Carolyn Collingwood in That's Succession. Right. Also Lady Shackleton in Downton Abbey. Ah. Yeah. Um, and Juliet Nichols tells her- Doing that, an American accent, no less. I know. And like sort of like a, like a hickish yeah, American uh -huh, accent, right? Uh -huh. And Juliet tells her that she thinks computer guy George was murdered because the last time she saw him- he was super excited to show her something he found, which this whole George storyline really lends itself to the outside is safe and everything in here is a lie because it does seem like he had discovered some pretty pertinent information that perhaps the higher-ups and judicial would not have wanted him to be able to share with anyone else, right? Right, right. So as we see, she finds a satchel with a rubber ducky Pez dispenser and a note inside it. And uh, then finds out Computer George is dead by alleged suicide. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, the perfect place to hide a thumb drive USB when, he, when she pulled out the, the rubber ducky Pez. And I'm an idiot because that drive was huge and would not fit in there. <laughs> um, but it turns out Juliet and Computer George were in an unsanctioned relationship, right? So it's not even called, I don't think it's called like marriage. Yeah, right, right. right. Uh, it's just sanctioned or unsanctioned. Theirs was uns unsanctioned, so Juliet goes down to the spot that George landed with Sheriff Holston and Deputy Marnes. We find out it was 3 a.m. when he was out on the, on the you know, balcony or whatever and either jumped or was thrown. Uh, Holston takes her to see the body. She tells him that George left her something, and then Juliet takes the sheriff on a long journey to this secret area of the silo near the bottom. We see the machine that she suspects dug the, the digger, silo. The digger. This was tight. Yeah. That thing was friggin' massive. Big old machine. And she explains that the theory goes that the digger gets down this far, and then there's no easy way to get it out, so the founders just wall it off with a 30-foot cap of concrete. And when you see the digger, at least for me, it was the first time it entered my mind, like, oh, there might be a bunch of these silos. Mm. This might not even be the only silo. Yeah. Because they well, clearly have this tech. So that that's, that's definitely like a... Yeah. Yes, our minds started going there as well. Like, okay, well, how does this relate to the greater world at large? Right. Right? Because even if this is 100,000, even if it's 2 million, there's, there's, you know, we got 7 billion people on Earth right now. Maybe it's, I think it might be 8 billion, closer to 8 billion at the moment. But so, like, these are these the only people left? Did everybody get put in a silo? Like, what's, 
Right. Yeah, that's that's another kind of looming question, I think, that I'll be interested to see if they tackle. Did all of the silos lose their history? Right. 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 Or do yeah. some silos still operate in a way that's connected with the outside world? Who knows? Um, they then climb an insanely long and seemingly unsafe ladder down to her and Computer George's secret lover's hideout. And she tells the sheriff that the last time she saw the Pez dispenser was down here in a box of old relics, which is important because the note that George left her asked, where is the last place you saw this? Um, but there's a new relic in the box, which you called out earlier. It's a video recording device, right? And she has never seen it before. Neither of them seems to know what it is. Uh, she then finds a wire that she follows to the edge of a little perilous walkway and pulls up a bag with the drive inside and instructions on how to recover deleted files with Sheriff Holston's late wife Allison's handwriting on the back, which is like a real, like, ooh, spooky moment for him, right? Yes. Um, the sheriff wants to take the drive because it's a red-level relic, a threat to order in the silo, and he wants to incinerate it. One of the nice things about the setup initially is that Holston is clearly like a very by-the-book lawman, follows the rules, does what he's told, doesn't have any outside suspicions, a real... You know what I mean? He's not the guy you would suspect to do some type of a rebellion, whereas his wife is very inquisitive, asks a lot of questions, is very suspicious. Um, and yeah, so I mean, he's like, even now, after her death with this woman, his instinct is like, I'm going to take this shit from you and incinerate it before anybody else can see it. But he ends up deciding to look into it, right? Yep. She basically talks him into it. And he says, when he finds something, he will send word, which it turns out takes a really freaking long time. He sits with it. Whatever it is that he gets in there and finds, which I'm assuming at some point we'll see, he does not just like go straight back to Juliet with it. He's like, he's, he takes his time to think through how to handle this, what to do. And then eventually we do know he has to go outside and then does. Which seems kind of like the sign, almost. That what? Well, she's waiting. Oh, she's oh. mad, calling him a liar because he never gave her a sign, right? Because yeah. he never, he, he's sitting that down there near the digger and saying like, you'll know, you'll know what it is. And my my thought was like, okay, I think him asking to go outside and going outside, it was like a pretty that's big- That's the sign. Maybe that's the sign. Yeah. But I feel like they talked more between then because why'd right. she call him a fucking yeah. liar? What was that about? Be- because he never, because he never oh. gave her the sign. Oh, that's so she's she just not picking about. up on it. That like, hey, this is the sign. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Unless the sign is the fact that he's trying to name her new sheriff. Which is also a weird element that we have here, yeah. Yeah. Because flashing forward, we see Deputy Marnes tell the mayor that Holston picked Juliet Nichols as his successor to be sheriff, even if she refuses, which I'm not sure is going to happen. Like, if they would just be like, well, we have to honor his wishes and slap this badge on a random mechanic, right? I think they're going to. But we'll see. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've got a feeling. Then back in the past... We see Juliet and George talking about how he uses this giant rope to go down to the bottom of the silo and try to find a door, right, that he suspects is down there based on what I assume is the blueprints that he That's, saw. Yes, yes. We see that little, when, when we're zooming down on the blueprints the first time that, that he and Allison are looking at it, there's, there's like a tunnel. Little, there's like a tunnel and then, yeah, a door. A, a yeah. Door. Yes. So in the present, Juliet takes that rope, walks to the end of the perilous concrete path and drops the rope down and lowers herself and we get hit with the second cliffhanger in two episodes. Yeah, basically. it seemed like a really strange decision to just like slide down that. What do you, what do you even do on the bottom of that rope? I, mean, I think you it's dropping like, into the water. What, what's going on there? The show is fairly metaphor heavy, right? Uh -huh. And it's like you would you'd have to do some extremely risky things to make a real difference, right? Like that's just like uh -huh. basically what I was because even when she fuck the rope, walking over there <laughs> when she's following the string right. to like go get the bag, I was yeah, like, no, yeah. uh, uh. See, this is when I'd be a failed rebellion leader right now. Is like because I'd just be fucking turning around and going yeah, back right. up. Yeah. Um, that thing looks awfully skinny and it goes over uh, uh, on top of this massive hole with deep water. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to let the string, nah, I don't need to know where it goes. No, nah, I don't need, I don't need to see that. <laughs> Sorry. Don't need to see it. Um, but yeah, two episodes, two cliffhangers and like, look, this show definitely, it was built to make you want to binge it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it's yeah. like you finish but it was released week like, by week. I know. That's what's crazy about it is that it's like, I, it had to have been. It had to have been torture because it's torture for me right now. Like I was like, just, I'm just yeah, going to watch this, this whole fucking thing. Yeah. But it is more fun to be able to enjoy it episode by episode and come in here and do the show with y'all. So um, those are the only two I've watched and I will be sticking to our schedule. I know for some people listening right now, you have failed and that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. We forgive you. Yeah. Um, just stick with us on the podcast though. So 
through two episode after episode two, how are you feeling? Still, still pretty good. I about mean, where you were after episode about one. About where I was after episode one. Yeah, yeah. I, yes. I was a little yeah. disappointed that they hadn't built on it more. Mm-hmm. Like that, I wasn't because I, I felt the same level of suspense and wanting to know what happened that I did after one episode, after two episodes, and I was like, okay, we could have gotten a little more momentum here, but yeah, it's all set up so far. I, look, there's a you know some sized elephant in the room basically just as we dive into this new show which is the fact that that we've and we've talked about this we just got off a a string of four incredible seasons of television yeah like an unprecedented run where all four shows that we watched were like objectively like a minus at worst right and mostly a pluses and a plus pluses right right so like it, it, one of the things that it was just making me think through two episodes is just like having even more gratitude and respect for the shows that we just watched because, you know, we had a buddy like who's further ahead of us on Silo tell us like, you know, there's just not as much, there's not as much to unfold and to talk about with these episodes. Right. And that's correct. Like that, it, like that's just, it. it's wild how much they pack into an hour of Succession or White Lotus or even or House of the Dragon. Yeah. Right. Like we bounce around so much, we're covering so many different characters, and like, you know, there's the, we're we're early on the runway here. This is three books. They got to set up the mystery, and then got to start building it out. So I'm sure that we have a lot more character introduction, a lot more plot introduction, a lot more. Like, there's going to be more and more stuff happening, but it's just like that's that that it's just we just have to look back at the last four and just say that was that was that, and this is this, and this is good too, and it's fun. Um, like I said, you know, closer to the front, like it's fun to have a mystery. It's fun to think about like what could and could not be happening. Uh, you know, we tend to do that on succession when there really isn't, you know, (laughs) little little princess is a perfect example of us like really hunting for, you know, a mystery when there isn't one. Right. Um, and so to have a show where that's like invited and kind of like what you're supposed to be doing, like the whole point, because it's the whole point and that there literally is a mystery. It's what the show's about. Uh, that's pretty fun. And so I'm, I'm happy to have something like that to watch. Yeah. The only show out of the last four that has a little bit of that is white Lotus, right? Cause you're given this setup at the beginning of each season. Mm-hmm. Hey, people died. Yeah. Bet you can't figure out who it is. And then you're kind of, it, and, well, at least me, you don't necessarily do this. You kind of take it episode by episode. Whereas I'm more watching everything through the lens of like, which one of these fuckers ends up a corpse. Well, and, I, and, and I mean, the, di- the difference being that like when, you know, when Mike White does that in White Lotus, it's almost like a, I know some of you want to do this. Yeah. yeah. So here, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is perfectly accurate yeah. when it comes to me. Um, and it's, it's like, you, you know, you can kind of like engage with it as much or as little as you want to on that show. Whereas, you know, on this one, it's like, this is the whole thing. It's like, we don't know, we don't have all of the information and now we're going to try to hunt it all down. Yeah. It's well executed through two episodes. I have, I've enjoyed the story so far, the acting, you know, there's not a whole lot of crazy creative, like cinematography shit happening so far. But, um, I think all the little, like, ooh, like the whodunit of it all and the, the, not knowing who's in charge, who built the silo? <laughs> we don't know who built the silo. We don't know, like, if there's anybody in the silo that knows... There's also, stuff, yeah, right? there's also this whole, like, obviously the question about what happened 140 years ago is a, is a big piece of the puzzle. And, like, who wh- who were the rebellion? Did the, Was the rebellion squashed or did the rebellion actually win? That seems to be, like, a question. Like, who the up top, the judicial, like, whoever is running this, were they the rebellion or did they squash the rebellion? That right. seems to be, like, a gray area that... It's kind of like did the you know did they just write the history the way they wanted it to 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 be read, um, and so there's you know there's there's a lot of unknown. You mentioned this as as being a major piece of the show is a, there's a the history is unknown right now. Yeah, um, and then the other thing just to to touch on that a little bit further that I thought was interesting is there's this idea right that like that the that the outside is dangerous and poisonous and like someday maybe you can go back. You're never going back. It's literally in the motto. It says in the motto that we don't know when that day is, but today is not that day. When you write that in like all of your scrawls and your creeds and your mottos and you say it every day and you pledge allegiance to it. And then every time somebody has to go out to clean or not clean, you can't force them to clean, but maybe they'll clean. And you say, (laughs) and you say, but what we do know is today is not that day. Like that's, 
you're being pretty clear that you're never going back outside. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't. You're t- not just going to one day wake up and be like, "We got to change the motto. Outside looks good again." Today is the day. <laughs> Today is. Today the day. is the day. Our bad. <laughs> Our, we've been saying it for years and years and years, but we we've been wrong. No, yeah. I'm with you, and I mean that's where. I start to really wonder, and I'm like, it's. I'm not going to sit here and play the guessing game because I could do it for 45 more minutes. But my guess is that there is some advantage to the up top people to keeping all of these folks in this silo. Yeah, right? well, they mean, are right. benefiting in some way that no one else is aware of. Yeah, and that there's there. This is why I think these two are alive. That Holston and Allison are alive. But it also doesn't make sense that the people up top would just let, like, all right, maybe they were like, all right, we're evil. We're evil sons of bitches. We're lying to everybody. We're lying our asses off. We've set up these screens to show fake images. We're really doing it. But if anybody says they want to leave, we'll let them leave. But they can't tell anybody else that it's cool out there, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, right, yeah. It's just a huge risk. Yes, like, it seems very, if, very risky. What if one yeah. day... 200 people are like, and I'm just going to take a shot in the dark here. I did have this this idea in my mind like, oh, there's going to be like a Spartacus scene where every single person in the silo at once is like, I want to go outside. Okay, I yeah. want to go outside. No, I want to go outside. And then they have to deal with the effects of that. But uh, it's just, it, yeah, it's impossible for me to really take a stab at it right now because I don't. There's so many different ways metaphorically based on human history, current events, past events that have really happened in real life, IRL, that they could use to shape the story and and say something about people and humanity in the course of history. So they've got plenty to play with. The setup is solid. Liked it so far. Um, Not a lot of humor. Not much much laughing, unless you're laughing at the cleaning, which I I did a little bit. (laughs) Uh, But, uh, yeah, and you mentioned, like, we're early on in this. Bro, I went to the IMDb to check on a character's name, and there is like 30 characters we haven't met yet. Yeah. Uh, in the first season alone, where I was like, <laughs> what the hell? One of them is going to surprise you and make you very happy, I think. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Interesting so far. Cause excited it's, to- Because it's Vin Diesel. No. He comes on and talks about family. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Vin Diesel. Okay. I will right. say this. The first red flag for me was seeing Common. I mean, no offense to Common, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, though? Like, I was like, okay, Common? Yeah. You cast Common. Have you ever seen Common in anything? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah you think so? It's never good. <laughs> it's never good. It's always, like, he was in uh, he was in that Western show I watched about the railroad. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what the was hell was it one? called? Uh, I forget. Hell on Wheels. Hell on Wheels, that's right. Yeah, he was shit in that. But anyway, that'll I'll leave it at that for Silo uh, episodes one and two. Um, do you want to talk briefly for a couple minutes about? Yeah, we should. But idol. first, uh, patrons, um, you know, if hopefully you can make phone calls to our hotline that are not that are spoiler free, please and thank you. Yeah, if you watch forward, definitely do not be hitting the hotline with spoilers, uh, please. But but yeah, but call in, call in, give us takes, give us questions, and. Um, yeah, we can let's let's touch a little bit on the idol. If you want to call in about the idol, we can't stop you. Also. No, uh, no, we can't. And obviously, I think this is a good show for the people on Patreon to remember. You can call about something else you're watching That's if you right. want. Yeah. Just keep it spoiler free, so that anybody who hasn't watched yet yeah. doesn't have things ruined for them. We're not going to play calls with spoilers. And and if I see if I listen to a call and it has a spoiler in it, I'm never opening another one from your phone number again. <laughs> um, just for the record, please don't do that. Not cool. Okay, I have watched the first two episodes of The Idol. And I've Barrett watched the has first watched the, the, the part, series yeah. premiere. Yeah. Now, I will just say that as I was watching the pilot episode, I was like, oh, thank God we didn't try to podcast about this. Because for everything you just said about the four-show run we were on, yeah. and how even with Silo, which I think is pretty high-quality TV so far, yeah. it's, it is a lot more limited in like things to discuss and depth to pull, and like it's more of just the puzzle box mystery of it all. The idol offers us next to nothing to like really because it's it's just it's so it's absurd. And the way I was describing it to Barrett is like it's this it's it's unaware of its absurdity. It does, and if it is aware, it's not letting you know on a funny enough level. Like, hey, it's okay to laugh at this because there's plenty of shit that is it's cheesy. Is the yeah. word I would use. Yeah, one of one of my main takeaways, and there were several, 
uh, after watching the pilot was that like I do f- I th- the concept is good and cool and interesting. Right. I like the concept of the show. That's why that's why I will probably one of the other things that I didn't totally realize is this is only five or six episodes. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that makes me happier. Um, so, I, like, I I will watch this show uh, because it and and a large part of that is that the, I think the concept is interesting. Now, after one episode, do I think that they may have failed miserably at executing on the concept? Yes, definitely, yes. Um, <laughs> but but I, you know. So that that that's that's one big takeaway is that like they had this idea and I can see why they got behind it and why HBO thought it was a good idea. The problem may have been that um, much like a band achieving wild success with their first album and then coming back and realizing that they don't actually have anything left to say and that maybe they put all of their good stuff onto the very first thing they did. Sam Levinson might be a total hack uh, and not have any fucking clue what he's doing and has been sailing on superb casting and acting from um success or from from, from from euphoria from from the 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 actors on on euphoria uh, yeah look that we've seen it happen with true detective Zendaya, season Sydney one sweeney hunter schaefer all the guys too yeah yeah we've seen this happen before where true detective season one with nick yeah Pizzolatto Pizzolatto was a great great, was great great example one of the greatest seasons of television i have ever seen and then every other season he has done since then especially season two was a laughing stock, like actually awful and didn't, I mean, season three was okay. Season four, he's not even in charge anymore because they were like, that's enough, Nick, go, yeah. <laughs> go do cocaine. Um, this, it feels like with euphoria, they were opening up a world that most people are not super familiar with. Like what is high school like now, modern day, how has it changed? Let's show the most extreme version of that. If you took every high school in America and the worst shit happening and the most complicated shit happening in every high school in America and you put it in one high school, what would that look like? And it is fascinating and there is all kinds of like new age stuff and things that 30 years ago weren't a conversation point or would never be on TV that they include um, that makes it interesting. But to your point, the performances on that show and the and and frankly the writing is solid too but like everything about euphoria just clicks and works and that's it just it worked yeah this is like he was like okay i'm gonna do euphoria style show again but this time it's gonna be an inner look at like a a a miserable pop star and like the inside of of the industry or something because the rid that part of the biggest thing about the idol to know is that it was two different people in charge of this when they first started. It was Joseph Epstein and Amy Simmons, who were the writer, showrunner, and director, respectively. And then I think six episodes in or something like that, like there's only, to your point, I just looked it up, there's only five episodes in season one now. But I think they got through six and were like, never mind, this didn't work, we're scrapping it. Uh, The Weeknd, Abel, Testafari, whatever his name is, was like, nope, this is too female. This is too much of a female perspective. We need to go a different direction with this. And they changed it entirely. So if you can think about how, like, if you've watched the first two episodes and you're like, I can see how this show could have been about a female being, um, you know, subjugated by this predatory industry Mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Yep. It's very Britney Spears. A right. lot of it is like from episode one and two, there's moments where you're like, well, that is almost like f- to a T, Britney Spears. And frankly, an inside look at how that all unfolded when she was a, a rising, you know, the biggest star in the world would be interesting yeah. as a TV show if it was gritty, right? But yes. only if it had that female perspective. Whereas now it's way more like people are calling it like a male rape fantasy. And I'm not going to go and say it's that, but it is extremely sexualized to be enjoyed by like straight men who are attracted to Johnny Depp's daughter. Yeah. And the, the, like, you know, it's unfortunate because of what it feels like is that, you know, Sam Levinson likes to be a pro- provocateur. Right. And likes to be edgy. And he puts a lot of sexy stuff on screen. And then the addition of the weekend to that, just like, you know, Elevated to this bad place where it's like all they wanted to do was provoke and be provocative and be sexy and lead with that. And so they're failing on the story level because there's there's so many like there's so many tonal differences in episode one as well. You have like this like this veepish style, 
you know, laugh thing going on with like the seven different agents. And for some reason, Hank Azaria is there doing an Eastern European accent. I guess they were just totally taken by uh, his role in Along Came Polly as this <laughs> as the scuba fucking director. No one scuba, <laughs> but like I don't know what he's doing. That's a weird performance. All the little, all the hangers-ons and the agents and the and and Eli Roth doing the agent or the the manager of Live Nation or whatever he is, like that's one show. And then we're doing another show in the club with Lily Rose Depp and The Weeknd. And look, Taylor Swift, it's a lot of fun. She looks like a great performer when she does the ten minute video for for um the the song that's slipping my mind right now, but the ten minute version of. Uh, the you know the big song from from last year, um, Ross is looking at all it too me. well. All too well. Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. That does not mean that Taylor Swift would be a great film or TV actor. It means right. that she can do she can do an interesting performance for a music video. Right. I'm not sure the weekend can act. Oh, I I hate him as an actor. Like through, it gets worse through episode two because he is a unbelievable performer. Yeah, that does a lot of cool things on stage and in music videos. One of the all time greats. Love the love the music, but so in the first episode, that's a bad performance. It's bad. Uh, it gets worse though. That's the thing. Episode two is not better. It's worse. Yeah, and it's he he can't deliver the cheese ball lines they've written in a way that gets you to take them seriously. Which is where I get to the place where I'm like, do they know I'm laughing? Or no. do they think I'm horny? The show is super self serious. Yes, which is it's an, too which, self-serious. Is, which is another problem is that it. This is a show that needed, that needed some lightness, and the only time you're getting that is with this weird, crude, crass side cast. Yeah. Side cast that's so far not even in the same show. No, I and mean, that's the thing. The side cast, like Dan Levy, is in episode one. I don't think he's in episode two, but Hank Azaria continues to be a big part of episode two. I actually end up like liking his character more than any other character because I'm like, well, at least he kind of makes me chuckle. Yeah. Um, but no, it doesn't seem to like fit together. There's these like f- funny, quirky little scenes that are like, wow, the industry is so complicated. When you're a star, it's not like you would think. There's nine people managing you, and your label's telling you to do all this shit. And like, some people care about you, like Hank Azaria's character, but then mm-hmm. some people really don't care about you. And then it, it then it's porn. Yep. And there'll be a porn scene. And I'm like, what the fuck? The vibe shifts are insane and they're yes. hard to keep up with. And there's also just the element, just to give one spoiler from episode one. So you're telling me Britney Spears in her fucking prime goes to the club and some <laughs> club owner is like, holy shit, it's Britney Spears. I've always wanted to fuck Britney Spears. And then that happens? Are you insane? The man has a fucking rat tail. Yeah, I yeah. can't take that story seriously and like just how easy it is for the weekend's character whose name is fucking Tedros Tedros is he supposed to be Kevin Federline I have like, no clue who he is supposed to be but it is guess he's supposed to be Tedros Tedros he's Tedros Tedros and no one buys the Tedros Tedros shit so far not through two episodes there's nobody watching who is like it's like if Entourage was the most self-serious show on TV and never veered from that yeah. like like, you're getting the sexy inside look at Los Angeles. It's like, no, the fuck we're not. This yeah. is ridiculous. I, like, yeah. I think, that, again, just to go back to the Sam Levinson and Abel piece of this, it's like Sam Levinson had the idea to do, like, the gritty kind of Britney Spears-inspired thing. And then he liked the idea of teaming up with The Weeknd. And then The Weeknd came in and yep. it was like, what if we had a scene where I choke her out with her own scarf and then I poke a hole in her mouth with a knife and I say, now you can sing. Now you can sing. <laughs> or like, show me, show, sing like you can fuck. I feel like sing uh, like you can fuck was like a, was like a line that he had in his mind was like, I got to put that in a Dude, there's show. a lot of those. I got to put that they in a come, show. They come more frequently in season, or in episode two, like the weekend is staying, saying stuff that I'm like, I can, I get how you wrote that on paper and went, yeah, that's real. But like, <laughs> it doesn't translate to the screen. Yeah. And you know what the other piece of it is, just to cap it off? I can tell exactly what happened with casting. They were like, we're not going to cast a single person who can't bring more eyeballs to this show. Like the the Asian chick who's in the dance squad. She's a huge, huge K-pop star. Every single person on this list, if you, if you see someone on screen, her name is Jenny Kim. She plays yeah. Diane. If you see someone on screen in this show and you're like, I don't recognize that person... 
Well, let me tell you something, friend. They're they have huge 30 somewhere. million yeah. fucking yeah. followers on social media, and that was the idea behind this show. They were like, we will get so many influencers that it can't fail <laughs> because they'll all be pushing out Instagrams and TikToks and tweets every single Sunday, and that will get enough eyeballs on the show no matter how bad this piece of shit is. Yeah. But it, through two episodes, <laughs> is a piece of shit. It is not It is not good. And I say this like we just talked about HBO's four shows in a row run of dominating Sunday night. For them to roll this out after that has to feel incredibly depressing. It does, yeah. Because they, they, this is just not it. Um, but yeah, Eli Roth is it? What the fuck? Dan Levy, Eli Roth, um, Lily Rose Depp. I want, I want to know what Johnny Depp thinks about this. I'm curious. Just out of, I'm just curious. It's like his daughter's big breakthrough, and yeah. it's like mostly smut. Yeah, it's smut. <laughs> it's this is smut. Um, Hank Azaria, who I've always loved, he's like an all time. Uh, he's a he's a voice actor on The Simpsons. The Simpsons? That's yeah, where he got yeah. his original start. But yes, along came Polly, one of my favorite roles, um, maybe ever from him there. <laughs> But there's so many people on this thing, and when I start, I was Googling at the names of the actors, and, like, first thing that pops up for most of them is their Instagram. And then clicking on their Instagram, I was like, who? 4.6 million followers? Who the fuck are these people? <laughs> and they're, it's just the most L.A. piece of shit that's ever been made. So I will also continue to watch it. I, you just made my day. I thought this was 10 episodes, and I was going to have to drag my wife through this with me for, like, two I, fucking months. So after the first, the reason I haven't watched the second episode, well, uh, yeah, I was on vacation and then, had, you know, was watching Silo, but I wasn't sure I was going to go back in. And then I heard that it was like only five or six episodes. And now I'm like, Ugh, okay, I guess I will digest this shitty piece of pop culture currently. I honestly think like, you know what? Gotta, after, gotta stay up with the zeitgeist, you know what I mean? After this week, Barrett and I will not be commenting on The Idol on our public show. We will save our commentary on The Idol for Patreon um, because I am watching to see how ridiculous and bad it will get. Yeah. Because this, frankly, the storyline that they have sort of laid out here through episode two, you kind of get the idea of where they're going where with going. this. Yeah. It is worse than you could have possibly <laughs> imagined. Like, it is a fucking nightmare. I cannot wait for you to to get through episode two so we can talk about it because it's dog shit. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for more coverage of Silo Season 1, we do an exclusive ad-free episode every week driven by hotline calls from the uh, community on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. We appreciate you, appreciate you everybody who's on Patreon and already. We will, we'll prioritize Silo content. Absolutely. There. Yeah, absolutely. Just to be clear. Yeah, but. we'll do all our Silo calls and discussion first, but then I do want to make sure that each week we get to make fun of uh, at least the idol a little bit and maybe discuss some other things we're watching too if y'all want. Yep. Um, subscribe on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles for as little as $5 a month to support our show. When you sign up, you get access immediately to everything we have already put on Patreon. So all of our successions, final season bonus coverage, The Last of Us season one, House of the Dragon season one, The White Lotus season two, and wait, there's more. Our entire companion podcast for HBO's classic crime drama, The Sopranos, friendly to both first timers and rewatchers is available in full on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. We would appreciate it if all season long you would support our sponsors by using our dedicated URLs and codes. That is how we pay the piper here at Oysters, Clams, and Cockles outside of Patreon. Today we had Factor. Go to factormeals.com slash OCC50 for 50% off your first box. That's code OCC50 at factormeals, F-A-C-T-O-R, meals.com slash OCC50 to get 50% off your first box. Links and codes for today's sponsor in the description of this episode. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at WR Bolin. Mr. Barrett Dudley, where can people follow you? Yes, get at me at Barrett Dudley, mostly on Instagram, sometimes on Twitter. And go to bowlandmedia.com slash shop to grab yourself some OCC merch. Barrett and I will be back on Thursday to further digest and discuss the first two episodes of Silo on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And remember, you cannot be forced into cleaning. <laughs>